This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 170, recorded on February 1st, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Nice to be with you. Welcome to February. <laughs> we are ready. Boy. We have one month of 2018. The year is over. <laughs> the year is it's over. It's moving quickly. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm well. My colleague in the office next to me just came back to work reporting he had had the flu. So I was Ooh. glad he stayed home. That's a good thing to do when you are infected. But unfortunately, many people do not. Yes. And that's, uh, that's how you spread infections. Let's yes. talk more about the flu today, shall we? We will. <laughs> and also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. You've been to California. Yeah, and I, Elio and I got a chance to sit and just chat. It's so nice. It's really lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in vivo, as he likes to so say. So lovely. You got away from the cold weather, right? I did, and got to visit my daughter, who's clerking for a judge out there. It was great. Wow. Nice San Diego. All right. Mm. Well, we're all back at TWIM. Beginning of February, the year is moving fluidly under the bridge, I guess. And uh, I have a follow-up, I have a follow-up email that I'd like to read. This concerns a um, link that Michael had provided in the last episode. This is from Stephen, who is an emeritus professor of microbiology at Virginia Tech. Stephen Boyle. Does anyone know Stephen Boyle? The name is familiar. Stephen writes, the formula for conversion of OD to E. coli cells per mil is essentially correct, but based on incorrect assumptions. Uh-oh. <laughs> he quotes, this calculator uses the extinction coefficients for E. coli and yeast cultures to calculate the cell concentrations from the optical density, OD600, reading taken with a spectrophotometer. The majority of light generated by the spectrophotometer is not being absorbed by the yeast or bacteria, but it's being scattered. It is incorrect to state that live or dead cells have an extinction coefficient when they are in the path of light with a wavelength of 600 nanometers. Extinction coefficients are generated as the result of light absorption according to Beer's law, which states that molar absorptivity is constant and the, absorpt the absorbance is proportional to concentration for a given substance dissolved in a given solute and measured at a given wavelength. I thought Beer's law was, oh, never mind. <laughs> we, we, better, we, we better say he's right and let's apologize. No, no, no. I, I provided that reference. It was uh, one of those handy dandy Google calculators that's out on the internet. So his comment, um, it's one of those details I didn't want to go into, but I agree wholeheartedly with him because um, I was always taught it's about mass and that's what he's getting to. It's about the mass of the microbe. He also points out that if you grow E. coli in enriched medium versus minimal medium, the cell sizes are different and therefore the scattering is going to be different. Absolutely. So he says the, the more accurate way to use the calculator is to be sure to teach that the data generated should be made for each type of cell under specific growth conditions, including the type of culture medium and not use extinction coefficients. I never, I never have, by the way. Mm. When we use it for Legionella, Legionella changes its shape during mm. its growth curve and, and it can get very elongated and filamentous. And that also then gives you a different CFU per OD unit. Yeah. So an easy thing to do if you want to know the state of your culture, you can measure an OD 600 and say, okay, it's ready. It's in log phase or whatever. That's fine, right? But when you know, want to know per mil, that's when it gets tricky. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for listening. So there you go. We have a retired microbiology professor listening to TWIM and keeping us honest. <laughs> That's yeah. right. <laughs> Thank right. you. Yep. Thanks a lot. All right. We have a snippet in a paper for you today. And I must say, Michael found them both. How did you find them, Michael? 
I was uh, <laughs> doing reading for my course. I'm teaching med micro ah. this semester to the dental students and the graduate students. And so like everything, you're you're looking for the most current information to to talk with the students about. And uh, I was looking at the growth paper from the week before and that wonderful uh, review article that um, Elio sent to uh, us a few weeks ago on physiology. So that got me into the physiology mode and I stumbled into this paper in PNAS, one of the n normal titles I, I look at, and it had math in it, just like the paper that Elio sent to us. And uh, consequently, I, I was intrigued and I always find plague fascinating. All right. Tell us about it. So the paper is human ectoparasites and the spread of plague in Europe during the second pandemic. And as I said, this was in the PNAS early edition, and it was authored by Dean Crower, Wally, Lingagard, Bramanti, Stenseth, and Schmid. And they are at the Center for Ecological and Evolutionary Synthesis in the Department of Bioscience. That's the title, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It, it, it is. Because I think if we ask the average individual what caused the, the Great Plague or the Black Death in Europe during the uh, Dark Ages or the Middle Ages or however you want to refer to it, most people will say, well, it was um, uh, the rodents, the rats. The rats had fleas and the fleas gave the plague bacillus to the humans and that was effectively then how it went from being the bubonic form of plague to the pneumonic form of plague and that was what was responsible for the bulk of the death and as some of you know the great plague of medieval times started in china followed the great trade routes to constantinople and then to the great capital cities of europe and according to the CDC, it was called great as it claimed an estimated 60% of the European population at that time. Amazing. Mm. And, you know, you, you really get chills when, when you think about a microbe that is able to do that. And this paper is fascinating because it brings to us the math that we all love to not think about. And I really liked how the authors introduced us to some modeling and how they effectively got to their title, how human active parasites, principally um, the Purlex irritans, which is a human flea, and body lice, Pediculus humanus humanus, and most Americans who have kids in uh, the primary school system know the most dreaded note your child can bring home from school is that there's head lice running in your child's classroom. And then you spend the rest of the evening picking nits or checking your child's head for these pediculous humanus humanus. And, you know, and this is the essence of the paper is that human body lice and human fleas were actually responsible for the great plague that started in 1334 and was with us through the 19th century when the third pandemic <laughs> started. And that again started in China, but that one was likely due to rodents. And we and, know and for human fleas, you're emphasizing that there are species of fleas that preferentially feed on humans, and then there are other species that preferentially feed on rats. Feed on dogs, rats and right? feed on dogs. And yeah. any of us who have pets know that the most dreaded thing that your dog can get into is fleas because then you got powder and you got drops and it's it's just a delight. <laughs> so um but there are some regions of the world where there are fleas that feed on humans, that the human yeah. population can support them. Mm -hmm. And so that you don't think that we're we're going back to the 1300s here on TWIM, because after all, this is this week in microbiology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not that week. <laughs> uh, it's, 
you know, plague is still unfortunately with us. And in fact, if you go to the WHO site, you find out that Madagascar, of all places, is experiencing its own epidemic presently. Uh, from August through October of 2017, there was a total of 1,800 confirmed probable or suspected cases of plague, including 127 deaths. And of these, 1,100 were clinically classified as pneumonic plagues. And so that's especially disturbing that it's actually person-to-person -person transmission and your principal risk factor of acquiring this form of plague is breathing as opposed to getting bit by a flea, whether it be from a human or whether it be from a rat. So the paper we're going to talk about today is not this historical curiosity. It, it actually can fall right into um, modern microbiology. And the authors have developed a susceptible infectious recover model. And in the show notes, I put a link to a paper by David Smith and Lang Moore, who will, for those of you interested in the differential equations, it's a nice instructional link to the SIR models in general. And it's from the Mathematical Association of America, and it will provide those who are math fiends, the overview of how the concepts behind the math impact the biology. But briefly, the authors use this SIR approach, susceptible, infectious, and recovered, to demonstrate that it was the human ectoparasites, the flea and the lice of humans, that were likely to have been the dominant mode of transmission of human plague during the Great Plague of the Middle Ages. These are different fleas than the ones carried by the rats? Yes, different fleas yeah. than the ones carried by the rats. So the rats and are exonerated? The rats are <laughs> exonerated. That's the take home message, Elio, in a nutshell. They actually take you through these beautiful differential equations. And the magic of their paper is because death was the endpoint. And the churches were taking censuses documenting when individuals die. They have good records of when people died. And so they have recorded mortality. They have the population census because most individuals in Europe at the time were baptized. And so you have baptismal records and you have death records. And so they use that in their model. And those of you following along in the paper – the parameters for their three susceptible, their SIR models are found in table two. And they literally tell you what is important in thinking about how this microbe moved from person to person and whether or not there was an intermediate involved. And so they have human parameters they have lice parameters, they have rat parameters, and they have flea parameters. And table two in this paper goes through what those are. It's properly referenced. So you, if you're curious what the transmission rate for bubonic plague from a mildly infectious human to body lice is, you can go and hunt that up and learn all about it. And for things with unobservable parameters, they use Bayesian inference. Now, Michelle asked me when she got this paper, she asked if I would simplify Bayesian inference for those folks following along who may not want to look at the math. And for those of you in the audience who follow baseball or at least saw the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill, which was based <laughs> on Michael Lewis's 2000 book about the champion Oakland A's, or if you're like my friends, who have spare time, <laughs> it's how you win at fantasy put football. Briefly, in Bayesian, it's the process of deducing properties of an underlying probability. Will I hit a home run? Will I hit singles? And then you add that to your analysis parameter of the data. So this is based on Bayes' law or Bayes' rule, 
which simply states the probability of an event based on prior knowledge of conditions. So if you have a baseball fan in your family, you know that they're obsessed with batting averages, earn run averages, and similarly in football, it's all about tackles and pass yardage and sacks. So that's effectively the underlying metaphor you need to understand in order to take the differential equations apart. Oh, I must say, though, when I look at table two, I'm stunned that you can yes. handle this many parameters in equations. Well, you know, for the... <laughs> this is really for stunning. The, yeah. For the three models, so they have the ectoparasite model, they have the mnemonic model, and they have the rat model. Well, the ectoparasite model requires more differential equations than the mnemonic model. The mnemonic model only requires three differential equations in order to effectively fit the data to the curve and ask, do the observed data meet their model criteria? The and is the reason, Michael, because mnemonic plague goes from person to person? Yes. So you, there, there are fewer uh, actors that you have to take there into account? There are fewer variables that you have to consider. So that's essentially the math distilled in a nutshell so that you can actually make beautiful sense of these things. Now, the rat, the rat that Elio was talking about in the beginning, uh, they have 10 differential equations that you need to do in order to fit the model. And they take I you through. Flung, I almost flunked a single differential equation, leave alone 10. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's it's really elegant how, how they walk you through this. And in general, the human ectoparasite model fits the pattern of the observed data, namely the number of people who died, as long as the number of people who died were enough. Mm -hmm. So they have these two small cities, EM and G, Givre, where it was difficult to distinguish between the models simply because they didn't have enough dead bodies because the towns were too small. And then Malta and Moscow sort of screwed up their models too because they had two peaks and their models didn't um, consider that. But when you look at the data, it's beautiful because it effectively confirms that it was indeed the human lice and the uh, fleas of humans that were responsible. And they throw another variable in here. They compared their three competing models using a process called BIC. And BIC is, again, Bayesian information criterion. And here you need to know that the model with the lowest BIC is preferred. So a low number is good and it effectively saying this model is uh, in agreement. And so they fit their models. And again, their data from the subsequent BIC analysis shows that the human ectoparasite had the lowest BIC value for all the outbreaks except for the two towns that had low populations. And for the remaining outbreaks, the difference in BIC for the human ectoparasite and other candidate models was greater than 10. And then and, this. And if I could just um, put a Please. sharp point on that, um, what's really impressive about this um, computational approach is that they were able to go back in time and look at what three different types of transmission, and they looked over nine plague outbreaks across centuries. Of years. Yeah, yeah, over several centuries. And then with that huge amount of data, they could see which, which model best explains what was observed. Mm. So it's I mean, very it's, different from bench science. <laughs> it's very different from bench science, but I think the other reason I wanted to bring this to the attention of our listeners is more and more we're seeing in the primary microbiology literature, the use of this Bayesian inference where you have some data you have some other data, you have these disparate data sets, and people are trying to bring things together. This is especially apparent in things like the microbiome. And so I think as you begin to read papers for which we have real data, and we know it does indeed hold, it's, it's important that you begin to, to think about these things and 
take it apart. And the last piece of data that I'd like to share with you in this snippet is the basic reproduction number, because many of you have probably, if you've been listening to the news about the flu and the they even the reporters are now talking about basic reproduction number or are not. And what they've learned here is the are not hmm. for their model. But was what is are not? What I'm is just, not? Oh, okay. are not is if I have an infection, the number associated with it is the number of other individuals I'm likely to infect. So there are not suggest that if I'm infected with plague, I'm likely to infect between 1.5 and 1.9 other individuals, considering it on, on a population. Do, do we know and what the number is for the flu? It's similar. We do know it. It's similar. It's similar. Right? Uh, and in fact, uh, if you're interested, measles, which is a, a nice delightful virus, which also has airborne transmission, has an R naught, where one case of measles will affect, infect between 12 and 18 other individuals. Wow. Great. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, one of the most contagious human viruses. Yes. Uh, but I would like to remind everyone, we do have a vaccine. You <laughs> have a <laughs> point. <laughs> and unlike, the, unlike some other viruses. <laughs> well, the 1918 pandemic of influenza had an R naught that they, depending upon the city, was between two and three. Hmm. So that's the last piece of historical data I'd like to share with you. But, you know, summing up, these authors did a outstanding piece of work. Their study supports human ectoplasm parasite transmission of plague during the second pandemic, including the great pandemic or the black death and using their recent experimental data on human fleas and body lice as plague vectors, they have developed a, this compartmental model concept that captures the dynamics of the human ectoparasite transmission. In, in other words, fantasy football for lice and disease and and it so I I really found that this paper from a snippet was compelling. It had many important learning objectives for uh, I I think our listeners will find interesting and uh, teaches a bit of history. Michael, if you were testifying in front of Congress and the um, the honorable senator from South Carolina said, Doctor Schmidt, do these data prove? that human ectoparasites transmitted the plague, what would you say? I would say they're, they're highly <laughs> suggestive. And to that point, I really appreciated that the authors in their discussion then drew from the current epidemiology literature and pointed out human studies that are, that are consistent with their historical interpretation. So, Michael, you mentioned uh, Madagascar. That, mm -hmm. um, because they have ongoing plague epidemics, is a great research site. So a group from the Pasteur Institute of Madagascar, working with colleagues from the um, World Health Organization, did a study where they collected fleas, 319 fleas um, from houses in Madagascar and then speciated those fleas and then looked within each species of fleas using PCR for evidence that they are carrying pestis, the bacterium Yersinia um, pestis. And the only flea that they found that contained Yersinia pestis was indeed this irritans, the pest, what was the first oh, the name? the human one. Yeah, the human um, Pulex, uh, flea. Pulex irritans. Yeah. Pulex yes. irritans. So again, and, and they found some of those um, infected fleas in homes where there had been a case. Again, they couldn't say with certainty that the flea was the source of the disease in that particular person, but the weight of the evidence, I, I agree, is consistent with, um, with the flea, human flea vector. Yes. So, Michael, is this... Well, it's a great story. Is this... Um, it, useful for helping to control current uh, epidemics of the plague? I think, as Michelle just highlighted, that the WHO is indeed looking in Madagascar to address whether or not it's rats yeah. or human transmission. The disturbing thing in Madagascar is the number of pneumonic cases because they're unlike, you know, you can protect yourself by cleaning up your house, getting rid of the fleas with... Uh, 
you know, a pesticide or just bathing Mm -hmm. or washing your clothes. But uh, the principal risk factor with pneumonic is breathing. And and so if you were living with an infected person or you're the caregiver for the infected person, it's it's really um, your risk is is much greater. So, you know, it's that's why it it's the paper that has everything. Mm. You know, it's <laughs> it's 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 reacquainting us with important concepts like the basic reproduction number and and again sh- driving home the importance of vaccination, if you know the are not, and all of these things, it, it really is is, is a, a good exercise. And and the math was was fun when you looked at it. I showed it to one of my colleagues whose husband is a math professor at the College of Charleston, and he found it absolutely fascinating as well. Nice. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. And now we have our second influenza paper on TWIM of this flu season. So it's appropriate. As everyone knows, it's in the news. Everyone's talking about what a serious influenza season this is. And um, so we should talk about influenza vaccines. And this is a paper published in Nature Communications. It's called Double Layered Protein Nanoparticles Induce Broad Protection Against Divergent Influenza A Viruses. First author is Lei Dong, and the last author is Bao Zhang Wang, and this comes from Georgia State University, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Emory University School of Medicine. This is a Georgia product. <laughs> now, as everyone knows, influenza is a respiratory disease that here in the U.S. in a temperate climate, it's, it's seasonal, comes up in the fall and lasts through the winter, goes away in the spring. It's here every year. It can be serious in the U.S. It can kill anywhere from 5,000 to 40,000 people uh, in the flu season. Those are based on historical numbers. And so you have to take it seriously. Now, we do have a vaccine. We have several vaccines against influenza virus. But the problem is that the virus can change from year to year. It can change in a small way, which we call antigenic drift. And that would make it necessary to make a new flu vaccine every year. And so the World Health Organization actually has an extensive global network which samples influenza viruses all the time and then twice a year says, okay, should we change the vaccine? And they make decisions so it has to be remanufactured and retested in those years. And sometimes it changes in a big way, which we call antigenic shift. And that leads to pandemics like the 1918 pandemic, 1957, 1968, 1977, and 2009. I know them all because I did my PhD on influenza. And knowing the years of the pandemics is sort of like uh, initiation rites. So we have a few influenza vaccines. Many of them are produced in embryonated chicken eggs. And I just read a paper, by the way, which says if you are allergic to fer- birds, feathers, it doesn't matter. You can still get that vaccine. We also used to always say if you're allergic to feathers, don't get it, but you can still you can take it. Apparently, it's not an issue. And then there are flu vaccines grown in cell cultures, and these are all inactivated, non-infectious vaccines. And then there's also a flu mist, which is injected into your nose with a syringe, not a needle on it, but just sprayed into your nose, and it replicates in your respiratory tract. So we have a bunch of them, but they're not that great. What do I mean by not that great? If you immunize 100 people, you're lucky if 60 of them will be protected against influenza after immunization, which is not to say that those 40 are not protected. They may get less serious disease, but we we clearly need a better vaccine. And more importantly, we need a vaccine that we wouldn't have to change every so often. And not as expensive. Because, you know, in order to get one dose of vaccine, you require one egg. One egg per dose. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Michelle. <laughs> it's it's almost an embarrassment because we've been so <laughs> successful with so many vaccines. And microbiology has done more than anything else to allow modern civilization in terms of health. And here is one where we are sort of, uh, we're, we're behind. Nevertheless, I do get it every year. You know, I, I do too. I think the it's vaccine, in, not the flu. <laughs> the vaccine, yes. 
I think it's important to get it because, you know, even if it's not 100%, it will protect against serious disease and it will reduce transmission, which means you're helping other people. So think there have been it. a whole bunch of deaths in San Diego. There's been a whole bunch of deaths. Yes. yes. All of them are people who are not vaccinated. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think, Vincent, you mentioned in an earlier discussion that another shortcoming of the vaccines is there's the immunity is not durable. That's right. It doesn't last a long time. It For fades. reasons that aren't understood? or It doesn't. No, it's not understood. You know, basically what we're saying is the memory, your memory of immunization mm-hmm. isn't very good. We don't really know why that is. Hmm. Um, so that's another thing that we would like. We would like a durable vaccine that lasts and that can protect you against anything, any kind of influenza virus that nature would come up with. Uh, another thing which is a mystery about flu is why it's seasonal. There's no good explanation for it, is there? Some work done a number of years ago suggested that it has to do with humidity. So in the winter, where the humidity, uh, where the humidity is low and the temperatures are low, this, this favors uh, persistence of infection in the environment. So there have been some transmission experiments that support that. I, I think the data are pretty good. But the problem is, Alio, there's also flu in the tropics, and it can also be seasonal there. <laughs> Where they, exactly. have, uh, where they have lots of humidity. <laughs> so it's not the only answer to that one. So we need a universal influenza vaccine that will induce broad cross-protection against lots of different influenza viruses and gives good, long-lasting immunity. And that's what this paper is trying to do. And uh, it looks pretty promising. Uh, now, a, a lot of people are working on this. We're throwing mm-hmm. a lot of money at it. And... People are trying to make universal vaccines, and there are two approaches that have been used by others, and they've been somewhat successful, at least in the lab, and and those two they're going to pick up on in this paper. So one of the proteins on the surface of the influenza virus is a glycoprotein called hemagglutinin, and this is an important protein because when you make, when you vaccinate people with an influenza vaccine, the immune response against that hemagglutinin is protective, and people have found that this protein, it looks sort of like a lollipop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lollipop head and a long stalk that attaches it to the virus. The, the stalk is highly conserved among different influenza virus strains. So people are trying to figure out how they could immunize people with the stalk and get a vaccine that would protect against many different strains. And it's been somewhat successful in various experiments. The other approach, there's another protein in the influenza virus membrane. It's called the M2 protein. And this is also conserved among different influenza viruses. And people have tried to um, immunize animals with that protein. And some good immunity has been developed, but it's not durable. So one of the problems is when you immunize people with proteins, you know, individual proteins aren't really great at making strong, long-lasting immune responses. You know, think of a virus particle. It's It's a small particle. Flu is about, I don't know, 30 or 40 nanometers in diameter. It's a particle. It's presenting the proteins and this particulate. And that appears to be really good for making an immune response. Whereas if you put proteins in, they're small. They may not last a long time. So what they do in this paper is they make what are called protein nanoparticles. So nanotechnology, you've all heard of it. Small particles which carry drugs or therapeutics of various kinds. The particles can be made of various things made of plastics or various metals. But here in this protein, they're making nanoparticles, which means they're small. They're making them out of influenza virus proteins. And they're going to use those to immunize mice and see what happens. So that's what- It's real bioengineering. Bioengineering, yes. Yeah. You're going to probably tell us how they make the particles, but I thought it was really wild. All they do is they they add ethanol. (laughs) That's right. They they, they coagulate them. (laughs) That's right. That's absolutely right. They solve it. They solve it. Then. <laughs> they desolve it. So what they do, they take these two proteins, the the stalk of the HA and the M2 protein, and first they make a tetramer of multiple copies of the M2 protein, which they have taken from human influenza viruses, swine influenza viruses, bird influenza viruses, and others. So they put four in a row and they make a tetramer, which means four copies of that. And that makes sense, right? Because this virus does hop from species to species and we get this mixing of the different 
viral segments. So we get these chimeras. So, so I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, and the idea would be that cover, you cover all of them. Right. So yeah, you have a yeah. vaccine, which maybe you get once or twice in your lifetime, and that would cover everything. So they start with this uh, M, uh, M2 protein from various influenza viruses. They make a tetramer out of it. Uh, and then, as Elio said, they make a particle out of that by adding ethanol, which takes out the solvent and, and it causes these things to form a particle, a nanoparticle, which is small. And you can't see it in a regular microscope. You need an electron microscope. So that's part one. And then they say, okay, we want to add the stalk of the hemagglutinin to this. So they take these nanoparticles made of M2 protein. They add the soluble, a soluble version of the hemagglutinin stalk, which they have produced. And then they cross-link it with a chemical cross-linker to the M2 nanoparticles. And so now you so have... It's not anything wild type. It's, <laughs> it's completely an artificial construct. Well, totally artificial. Nothing like this. But it turns out it looks sort of like a virus particle. It's about the right size. Yeah. And so you basically have a core made of M2 protein and then little HA stalks decorating it. And uh, that is their protein nanoparticle vaccines. They have two that they make. So HA, all the HAs of influenza viruses that are out there, you can divide them into two groups, group one and two. And if you immunize with from those from one group, they don't really cross react with the other. So you're, any vaccine that's universal has to have both in it. And then they show that, you know, these, these uh, nanoparticles have the right proteins in them. They seem to be folded properly. They're recognized by monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, then they inject them into mice. And by the way, they, they can control the size of these particles, by how much they desolvate them with ethanol, how much they cross link. They say that small ones are better. This is something I learned. They say small nanoparticles induce cytokines, which give you a better immune response. I didn't know that. And and is that in a tissue culture dish or in an in a mouse? It's in an animal. Yeah. Because it might be um, uh, just how if you, you can imagine if it was a big hunk in protein, it might just sit at the site of injection. Yeah. But if they're smaller, they might diffuse a little better. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, they've looked, I'm not sure if it's in an animal, but the paper is talking about dendritic cell processing, and it's better if they're smaller. The other thing about these nanoparticles, which they mention is, you know, they've cross-linked the hemagglutin and protein to the core, and they said these probably come off very slowly in, in uh, cells that pick up the particles, the antigen-presenting cells, and they think that a slow release of the antigen is really good. All right, so the real key here is they take these particles, which, by the way, they look at in the electron microscope. They can see that they are, they resemble virus particles and that they're spherical. They immunize mice by injecting them into the muscle. They give two uh, injections, and they include adjuvants. An adjuvant is a chemical that you mix with, an, with a vaccine that will give you a more robust immune response. And if you've ever had a vaccine and, it, and your arm hurts within the next few hours, that's because you're having a good immune response at the site of injection, and adjuvants make it even hurt more. <laughs> they do get indeed. A, a little inflammation, call the white blood cells to the site. Inflammation is yeah. good. Yeah. Now, a lot of people have the, the human papillomavirus vaccine, for example, has a very high adverse event rate, which is mostly pain at the injection site because there's adjuvant in that vaccine, but that means it's working. Anyway, mm -hmm. they get really good immune responses against these two different kinds of nanoparticles. And um, they, they find that antibodies are produced that, that will um, react with the original particles. And they react, so they put, remember, they have two different kinds of particles, one against group one, one against group two HA, and they both react with uh, the right HA. And if they make a cocktail of the two, they mix the two different kinds together, they get a really broadly uh, reacting Immunogen, which when injected into mice, makes antibodies that will react with a whole range of uh, hemagglutinins, you know, bird, human, uh, etc. I love the way they displayed that result, too. I believe in figure 2B, they, they used what's called a uh, radar diagram, yeah, that's pretty nice. which schematically can show the profile of the antibody response and compare directly multiple um, antigens. Right. So I, I, I really appreciate whenever I read a paper, when somebody has got a great visual to, to display a lot of complicated data. 
So they not only look at antibody responses, they look at cellular responses. They find that immunization with these nanoparticles induces lymphocyte populations. They have an assay for that. And they also show that these are virus specific. So they look at both antibody and cellular responses. And both of them are probably important uh, for resolving influenza virus infection. But now the key is what happens if you challenge these mice? Now you've immunized them. Now you infect them uh, with influenza viruses. And you need to use, because this is a mouse, you have to use a mouse adapted influenza virus. So you can't use every strain. But um, but this goes importantly to show that should the virus have a dramatic change in its makeup, it will this vaccine cocktail will likely work. It should it should? Yeah. Of course, we don't know when it will happen in people because yeah, that's true. People are not mice; they can process the antigen differently. So this will have to be eventually studied in people. But in mice, these immunizations with these particles confers complete protection against death and weight loss with. Uh, the same type of hemagglutinin. Of course, if you mix them, then it will make different, uh, then it will protect against either one. Now, the cool thing that they can do here, and you need a mouse-adapted virus, but you can give that mouse-adapted virus uh, different genes on the surface. You can give them a different hemagglutinin. And so they could test, for example, uh, different avian influenza virus hemagglutinins, and they see that they get protection against these as well in mice immunized with a mixture of these two different nanoparticles. So they are protected against death. They're protected against weight loss. They have less virus in the lungs, and they have less pathology in the lungs as well. Um, if, they take anti if they take serum from these immunized mice, they can transfer it to another mouse and protect them uh, against infection, and they show that this protection requires a, a certain type of immune cell uh, which is known to be involved in, in protection against infection. And in fact, the last experiment they did is really interesting. If they, you can deplete in your lungs, you have what are called alveolar macrophages. These are cells that are important in um, defenses against virus and bacterial and other infections. If they deplete the macrophages, even if they give those mice serum from immunized animals, they won't be protected. So not only are antibodies involved in protection, but uh, macrophages as well. And they find that this protection lasts up to four months after immunization in mice. And remember, mice only live about two years, so that's pretty good. That is pretty good. And do, the, do mice undergo the same sort of senescence to flu vaccine that humans do? Now that's a good question. I don't know the answer. What do you, to mean, that. What do you mean by senescence there, Michael? Well, um, you know, we don't get lifelong immunity to a flu vaccine and our immunity wanes. Yeah, that's mm -hmm, the thing we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier. Yeah. The durability. I see. The durability of the vaccine. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that many, many uh, experiments have been done in mice with, with the human type vaccines. I don't know what I don't know the answer to that. Um, so that's the that's the paper. Basically, they have developed this very interesting protein nanoparticle, which looks like it could be a universal flu vaccine. Water. It seems to protect against lots of different isolates of influenza virus. And I didn't mention it, but the H5N1 is one that scares many people. It's an avian virus. The H7N9, which is currently mm -hmm. causing outbreaks in China, protects against all of those. And so you here you have a very interesting formulation. It's not hard to make. You don't have to grow it in eggs. These are just proteins that you uh, produce. So this is a proof of concept. And now, of course, they'll have to do some more animal experiments. But eventually, this could, in theory, go into clinical trials in people uh, and maybe someday be used. The exciting experiments are going to be in ferrets. Ferrets will be next, yeah. Whether or not this protects ferrets from a uh, live challenge of you know, normal virus. Yeah. By aerosol transmission too. Yeah. yeah. Aerosol yeah. transmission. Yeah. Well, there were, so they actually start with, um, a couple, uh, tubes of pure protein right. of each of these flu proteins. So, so listeners might wonder, well, how do you get that protein? The method they're using is a, um, insect cell expression system. Mm -hmm. So they can infect these insect cells with a, a baculovirus that is um, designed to express the flu protein. 
and then they harvest the protein from cells. I don't know. Do, do the cells then secrete the recombinant protein? They do. Yeah, it's made. Uh-huh. Uh, it's made so it's secreted. And then, so you can then, imagine uh, having large vats then of these insect cells, just continuously making it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in fact, one of the flu vaccines, it's called flu block. It's made in insect cells. It's the complete HA, including the the lollipop head, and it's secreted. It forms virus-like particles, uh, it, Neat. and those are purified and injected. Unfortunately, they're not as any better than the conventional vaccine, but the production method is very cool. So you think the production of this will be cheaper, it should cheaper be. than eggs? It should be, yeah. yeah. Vincent, being that you're the expert on RNA viruses, what's your guess? Is this going to be the answer? It looks promising, but the problem is these are mice and things can be very different in people. You know, as with any, any medical product, you test them in animals, it looks good, you go into people, it can be completely different. You know, so it's really, you can't predict. So far, this looks really good. You know, it looks like it's cross-reactive. And so if these are antigenic in people, then it would work. But we'll know maybe in about five years or so. Uh, Mm -hmm. By the way, they also say, because these are protein nanoparticles, they don't need refrigeration or freezing to keep them. They will last for for three months at room temperature. Wow. So that's good. great. So you you can give them to a country that doesn't have a lot of refrigerators and infrastructure. infrastructure and you, you know, you can store them for three months until you use them. And it should make it cheaper in, in developed countries as well. Yeah. This is very cool. I also thought it was neat that they mentioned, um, in addition to this vaccine application, these same bioengineering principles could be used for delo- um, kind of slow-release delivery of protein yeah. therapeutics. Therapeutics, drugs of various kinds. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah it's got a lot of so. potential. I, I think this is a very, very cool uh, discovery. I mean, other people have worked on these for other purposes, but... Uh, this is the first I know of a for flu. It looks great. Made made the news, you know, a lot of news outlets covered it. Uh, so I was uh, disappointed they didn't have a name like Flink. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I have one word for you, Flink. <laughs> yeah, double layer yeah. protein nanoparticles. This just doesn't roll off the tongue no. quite as well. No, it doesn't. Yeah. That's so, Vincent, are you going to are you going to discuss this paper over uh, this week in virology? No, this is twin paper. We do, just one. Yeah. I um, beat him uh, to it, Elio. I, I got it for hey, us. Hey, I, know, I, 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 for don't, us. I don't like to double dip because there's so much out there that you don't have That's to do true. that, right? But Michael got it. Well, I said, okay. And I think someone is... You know so, what? It's, yeah. it's, okay. it's okay to discuss a bacterial paper in, in TWIV. Sometimes we do bacteriophages on TWIV, right? Okay. But yeah. we don't do sure. pure bacteria because that's really TWIM, right? <laughs> but as you'll see, we have a letter. I don't know if we'll get to it today from someone who said they love the cross, the, the cross discussion. You know, we had De Pommier on Twim a while ago. We talked about virus on Twim. They said they really like that. So let me read a couple of emails. Uh, this one is from Anthony. I think I have two from Anthony. He writes late last night in that little interval between exhaustion and sleep after showering. I take a cat for a little walk in the hallway. I then sit on the steps with her for a few minutes. My thoughts strayed to chimpanzees, wondering how they bear a tropical climate without bathing. Might there be something in their skin microbiome that naturally cleanses? Might they here be the means to wage war against MRSA, analogous to the Merck gold mine found under the green of a Japanese golf course? And he's referring to ivermectin. I'd forgotten my conversation with myself until you mentioned in TWIM 168 about the dairy farmers showering less than once a day. Might the richness of their superficial flora extend past the nose? Might that make less frequent bathing impossible? (laughs) Oh, I like that idea. (laughs) I don't know. It's a good thought. Um, I don't know if chimps care how they smell, right? It's probably not. Probably a human thing. Someone pasted in. Uh, about, well, that you know, was me. Tell us that what that me. is, Michael. What's that? Uh, Ilio, do you know uh, Richard Gallo at the University of California, San Diego? He's chief yes, of well. derma- He's chief the of Richard dermatology. Guy. And yep. he said, good bacteria are educating your own skin cells to make your own antibiotics. And it's only yeah. been in the last hundred years that we have made bathing a daily practice. Mm. Are we overdoing it? So Gallo believes showering not only removes lipids and oils that keep your skin from drying out, showering also removes some of the good microbes. And I know that 
you'll actually change your flora and they'll actually use, um, you'll get more nitrogen consumers. They'll, they'll begin to, uh, the ammonia oxidizers will actually begin to come up on, on your skin. Mm. And in fact, that should have been one of the questions we asked our astronaut on TWIV when she joined, yeah. uh, joined <laughs> you at ASM. How do they deal with the whole issue of not showering daily? That's right. No, nothing they can do about that. She's, I think it smells on the space station. Yeah. Of a variety of things. Yeah. So Anthony also sent um, a Times article of a few weeks ago. There was an article about E. coli deaths from uh, contaminated romaine. And, and Anthony asks, would rinsing help? Michael, I think you put this information. In I, I did from the USDA of washing produce. And they, the United States Food and Drug Administration, um, strongly encourages us to indeed wash our, our uh, fruits and vegetables before eating. So if they, if they had washed the lettuce, would it have helped? Or, I mean, it seems to me you can't get every, you can't, you can't scrape it all, all the way off. And it, it really depends on the initial dose yeah. that's been associated with that uh, contaminated romaine. So if you could get it down in, in, in numbers, you'd probably help yourself out, right? Yeah, because remember, uh, for normal E. coli, you need to ingest about 100,000 in order for it mm. to manifest disease. But some of the E. coli with um, the hemorrhagic toxins that are in them, like O157H7, you only actually need between 1,000 to 10,000 to ingest in order to manifest disease. So, yeah. And that, yeah. has, that has more to do with it the bacteria's ability to tolerate the acid bath in our stomach mm -hmm, than it does mm -hmm, the toxin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That is true. So acid resistance is a, is a serious virulence trait for these gastro uh, enteropathogens yeah. enteropathogens. That's the word I wanted. Thank you. I, I also recommend that even if the bag of lettuce says pre-washed, just wash it because you I just, do. you just don't know. I, I, Michael and I were at a talk at ASM one year. Someone from the USDA, I think, showed, yeah, showed, it a, was. showed a picture of a bag of pre-washed lettuce and one of the leaves was just covered with dirt inside, yes. inside the <laughs> bag. So don't trust them. I recently went to an indoor farm in Brooklyn. We did a podcast there a couple of weeks ago with Dixon de Pommier and, you know, they grow lettuce in hydroponic. There's no dirt. And, and I, they gave us a box of lettuce to take home. And I still washed it because who knows who's touching it? You know, they didn't wash their hands. Mm -hmm. We have an email from Shinichiro Enomoto, who was one of the co-authors on a paper we did a couple of weeks ago about uh, the path to endosymbiosis. He writes, thank you for discussing our paper. I used to listen to TWIV and TWIM regularly when I had a long commute but I would have loved to hear Alio's thoughts on our work. Alio was, was out for that episode. I am his fan and do not mean any disrespect towards Dixon. As for Dixon, we would love to know where Sodalis precaptiva lives after injection. Injection into the thoracic cavity is artificial, and we don't know the true lifestyle of the S. precaptivus. With these caveats, I imagine that the bacteria live throughout the hemolymph as I have recovered colonies from an amputated leg. We don't know if they are intracellular, though. We have preliminary data that suggests that the bacteria can survive for a few days in mouse lymphocytes. We regard the S. precaptivus as a proto-symbion, considered ancestral to many of the insect symbionts. The two relatively young symbionts, S. glossinidias of the tsetse fly and Candidatus sodalis pyrantonius of rice weevil, have different homes and lifestyles. Candidatus pierantonius lives in bacteriomes near the gut and near the ovaries. It is suspected that the one near the ovaries gets transmitted and one near the gut provides amino acids. In contrast, S. gossinidius lives in the hemolymph and bacteriomes have not been detected. This bacterium is facultative and has been cultured without the host. Moreover, it was recently shown that even paternal transmission can occur. Given hmm. enough time, S. precaptivus appears capable of evolving into different lifestyles, but it's also possible that there are many proto-symbionts that are already specialized towards different hosts. Shin Inomoto. All right, that's cool. I love when the authors write in. <laughs> yeah, and, and 
really elevate the level of discussion for us. That's great. And Elio, I don't know if you caught it, but he said he is your fan. Well, I'm glad to hear that I'm becoming his fan. <laughs> Mutual. <laughs> All this right. is lovely stuff that he shared with us. All right, let's uh, end it there. We have a few more, but send them in. You can send us emails, twim at microbe.tv. And you should subscribe to the show so you get every episode as it's uh, released. And if you like us a lot, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for different ways that you can do that. Today, we have been blessed to have on our show, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Elio Schechter from Small Things Considered. Thanks, Elio. Oh, a pleasure. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of Quim and Ray Ortega for his technical help and Ronald Jenkins for the music you hear at the beginning and end. He's at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.